Hello, it's Shelly's Nursing Review with HETV, Health Education Television. And I don't know if you know what we're doing now. I mean, you know, the test is out. Um, the new test has proven to be not scary at all. In fact, if you saw my advice on the new test, the new NGN NCLEX exam, you know I said it seems to appear easier than the last old fashioned test, I guess you could call it. And so I wanna give you encouragement but yet we do need to study, right? So the encouragement is remember the differences. The differences between the NGN, NCLEX or whatever else is and the old test is that you do get partial credit, you get normal lab values, and you actually do get um, more medications and infectious diseases. Now, today we're doing something different. We started last week with me videotaping a series on Parkinson's. Today's um, topic is sickle cell crisis. Well, sickle cell disease, incorporating, of course, the crisis, which is what you get a lot of questions about. And I want you to know which package you should be trying to find in your repertoire of goodies. Now, you know already that if you're looking at me right now, you should have, if you didn't, received an Oh My God comp complimentary packet, meaning you don't pay for it. And it's my study guide, right? It's what I give to you from my heart to yours, well, from my heart to your brain, so that you can study and be ready for the NCLEX, because I really think it's it's an amazing study guide for you. Now, I wanna show you everything that we're talking about. The complimentary Oh My God packet is this. The handouts that we're using today are actually two fold. And that's because we need to make sure when we talk about sickle cell that we understand there's an approach to sickle cell as a pediatric nurse and there's an approach to sickle cell as a med search for adults nurse. So in the pediatrics packet or in the hematology packet is this exact same handout. So you can see it says sickle cell crisis. And if you need these handouts, of course, I actually have these for you. We can easily upload those for you at a cost, a discounted cost. Always remember you're an HETV subscriber for which I give discounts to, okay? Whether it's a an online review course or whatever it is. Now, just in case you didn't see the description of some of the videos, I'm gonna put the information on this video at the end of the video so that you can see how to reach out to me and ask for some of my complimentary or discounted materials. But let's get started, shall we? Number one, sickle cell anemia, which is the topic of today, it's very important that you remember what we've been doing since last week when I started with Parkinson's. We have been putting all of our new lectures into the next generation NCLEX or NGN NCLEX format in terms of helping you prepare for your case studies. Remember that on the new NCLEX exam, they're testing for your clinical judgment. And so today's video on sickle cell anemia will actually be looking at how to help you answer the first and the second questions of the unfolding case studies on NCLEX, which has a total of six questions each. First is recognize cues. So the clinical judgment model has six steps. The first step is recognize cues. The next step is analyze the cues. And so what I'm doing today, and hopefully you'll understand it very thoroughly, is getting you to see the introduction to sickle cell anemia and how to implement these two um, parts of the clinical judgment model. So let's get started. First, it's important to do the demographics. The demographics of sickle cell include men and women can get it, it is a genetic disorder. This genetic disorder is called autosomal recessive, which means whenever you see autosomal recessive in anything, that means that both parents must have the trait. 
And there's about five other diseases that you have to know are autosomal recessive, including PKU, including thalassemia, including Tay-Sachs, including cystic fibrosis, and then there's sickle cell. So I'm gonna say those again, because those are five autosomal recessive disorders. Sickle cell, cystic fibrosis, thalassemia, Tay-Sachs, and PKU, okay? All right, because you might get that in a select all format one day, you just never know. All right, so this autosomal recessive genetic disorder, this child, later adult, was born with this disease. Both parents have the trait, and let me just say that's an absolute. Both parents have the trait for a child to have the disease. And there have been certain situations in my professional life as a nurse midwife and certain situations even as an, a professor teaching this NCLEX review that have blown my mind. Let me give you one of them. I'm teaching you right now exactly like I was teaching a class full of students. And I said what I said to you, which is that this is an autosomal recessive disorder. It's genetic. Everybody um, that has this situation, this disease, their parents had the trait. Like there's no way to get this unless both parents have the trait. Like I said that. And this student said, uh-uh, nah, uh-uh, Dr. Shelley, nah, because um, mm -mm. my niece, she got sickle cell and my brother does not have no trait. Not, not HETV family. I had to do some strategizing because you know, you're talking about a class full of people and I was trying to figure out how to say that. And I was thinking of Maury Povich and I was thinking about paternity tests and I was thinking about Jerry Springer. And I was like, oh my God, like for real, like for real, I think I'll just turn around and, and start writing on the board because I don't know what to say. And then somebody in the class said, cause y'all is ghetto. Y'all said somebody in the class said, well then he ain't that baby daddy. And let's suffice it to say, I felt terrible. This child never showed back up to class. I never seen this child again. I guess we started some family drama. Somebody might have got shot. Somebody might be in jail. I don't know. I just know. I'm telling you, so you ain't going to be acting crazy, that both parents must have the trait. Okay? <laughs> okay. Now, I did have a situation where I delivered a baby and um, I teach the whole time I'm doing prenatal care. And when I first met this couple, I was teaching um, when her labs came back and I taught this patient who already knew but for, had forgotten to mention it, that she was sickle cell trait positive. And so she said, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, that's true. And you know, cause I knew that she was of the ethnicity that is at risk. So I had did a sickle cell screen. And so the, um, the father who was with her at every visit, he said, oh, well, what does that mean? I said, well, baby, that means that I need to check your blood and see if you have the sickle cell trait. And then if you do, we need to go ahead and talk about what that means. Right now, it doesn't mean anything until I know what your status is. Well, then he came back to the next visit and his sickle cell trait was negative. Um, and things went on the way they go because if one parent is positive and the other one is negative, then nobody has to worry about this child. Now, I delivered the baby and life went on about its way. And uh, about two, three weeks after I delivered that baby, beautiful baby, here come this baby daddy. And he has this paper in his hand and his face is very, very red. It looks like he's even been crying. And he brings this paper in and he says, um, you know, uh, I thought that you said my baby can't have this disease because I ain't got this disease. I said, well, what are you talking about? You know, because you get you deliver a lot of babies. I mean, I delivered babies for 20 some odd years. Well, I thought you said I couldn't have blah, blah, blah. And turns out that indeed this baby that I delivered did have sickle cell disease. 
And so when he said, I thought you said my baby couldn't, I said, well, that's true, dear. You, your, chi your child could not possibly have sickle cell. Well, I got a letter to, in two weeks um, after the baby's born. We got a letter saying the baby's positive sickle cell disease. And, and, and here go the paper you showed me with my test result. So you tell me how that's supposed to work. Like, how is that? I said, well, you know what? And then he looked at the paper and looked at me. He threw it down and screamed. That means I'm not the, you know, I'm not the father. My heart broke. Okay, let's keep it real. My heart broke, but I'm trying to tell you that knowledge is power. And so who would have thunk that nine months ago as I'm teaching prenatally to the patient and I'm teaching prenatally to the to the father of what we thought was this child um, that's still in the, the womb, who would have thought that it was valuable enough to convince him to question the paternity of this child? So I'm telling you through those stories, 100% both parents must have the trait. Now, let's look at how that plays out, okay? Because we then take it a little bit further. We say that if the child, or I should say, if both parents have the trait and they are, are planning a child, there is a 25% chance of having a child with sickle cell disease. Now, the cultures affected, African-American, Latino, Caribbean descent, often gets missed because everybody always talking about black folks. Well, that's true. That's the majority. Don't get it twisted. That is the majority. In fact, it's such a majority that one in 12 African-Americans has the sickle cell trait, which is about 8% of blacks. And one in 365 African-Americans have sickle cell disease. But then if you just stuck with black folks, you would ignore the Latinos and people of Caribbean descent. And that just happened about a month ago. An eight-year-old child was a migrant um, in Texas and she died because she had a history of sickle cell and they didn't bother to read the records or find out her history. And this child was seen nine between nine and 10 times, maybe even 11 times by a nurse practitioner who diagnosed her with the flu or pneumonia or whatever, gave her some uh, Tylenol, uh, actually diagnosed her with the flu, gave some Tylenol and some Tamiflu, and then went on about her business, sent the child back to the detention center. This child died, and then make it worse to bring down this 105 fever that she damn near had. This child was given ice packs, and given a cool shower, both of which kill sickle cell. Okay, they kill the sickle cell patient. Okay, y'all with me? In other words, you you put ice or a cold shower on a sickle cell patient when one of the triggers is extreme temperatures, you just cause an accentuation, a, 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 an acceleration of sickling in the body. We'll talk about that later. But let me just say, when it comes to the fact that 25% that, that these two parents have a 25% chance of having a child with sickle cell disease. I want you to see how I got there. So come on over here with me. You have to know your labs. If we are diagnosing sickle cell, and I'll talk about this later, but if we're diagnosing sickle cell, we do something called a hemoglobin electrophoresis. And it's going to tell us what kind of hemoglobin the patient has. Now, it's very important that you know there's not just one genetic um, hemo, uh, hemoglobinopathy, I call it. There's many others. There's something called a hemoglobin C trait, which is much milder, much more rare. But again, if two people have the hemoglobin C trait, the mother and the father, there's a chance of having a hemoglobin C child it's not sickle cell, it's way milder, but that is a possibility. We're talking about sickle cell. Hemoglobin A, A for adult normal. Hemoglobin S, S for sickle. Hemoglobin AS, because when we conceive a child, we give half of our genetic um, data and, and half of our chromosomes to the child. So if you look at this, it says hemoglobin AS, 
That's called the trait. Watch this. Mom has the trait. There's mom. She's an A and an S. Y'all good? And then dad has the trait, which is an A and an S. You gotta watch this. You gotta really be like all up on me about this because I need you to understand. And once my students see this, they're like, oh, I get it now, okay? So how is it that I can say there's a 25% chance of having a child with sickle cell disease? There is a 50% chance of having a child with the trait. And there's a 25% chance of having a child with nothing. I can do that because of this. So watch this. When mommy and daddy conceive, they give half of their genetic material to the child. So dad is gonna give half, half is an A, the other half is an S, so he's gonna give half. Mommy is gonna give half of hers. You see two A's. What is that? That's within normal limits. That's a child with nothing, no trait, no disease. Stay with your girl. If you look over here, mom is gonna give an S, daddy's gonna slide his A right over there. That, as you know, is the trait. So this baby has the trait. Now let's do another one. Mommy gives half of her genetic material. Daddy slides his S right on over here. Again, trait, if you'll recall, I said there's a 50% chance of having the trait, okay? Lastly, mommy sends her S, which is this. Daddy sends his S, and oh my God, there is the disease. So there is a 25% chance of having a child with nothing, a 25% chance of having a child with sickle cell disease, a 50% chance of having a child with the trait. Now this is with every pregnancy. There is a misconception in many African countries because obviously African-American blacks have this higher likelihood of having this this disease because of malaria and it being considered to be protective against malaria. So what that means is that in many, many African countries, there's a misconception of what I just did. There's a belief that if I just have four children, I'll get one that's normal, two with the trade, and just one out of the four with sickle cell disease. No. This is a 25% chance of having a child with sickle cell with every pregnancy. In other words, you could actually end up with your four children, all of them having sickle cell. And that's why we really have to do as much teaching as we can with our wonderful sisters and brothers across the globe, okay? So this introduction to sickle cell anemia Remember what I said, it's autosomal recessive. Both parents must have the trait. There's a 25% chance of having a child with sickle cell disease. The cultures most likely affected, African-American, Latino, Caribbean, and of course, African, which is not the same thing as African-American, okay? There is a um, test that we do, the hemoglobin electrophoresis, which will identify whether or not the patient has hemoglobin A, hemoglobin S, hemoglobin A, S. Normal sickle trait type of pattern. There is a one in 12, uh, there are one in 12 African Americans with the sickle cell trait, which is about 8%. There's a one in 365, uh, one in 365 African Americans have the sickle cell disease. So as a nurse, you will see this. Now the life expectancy was really low, shall we say back in the day before we got some of these nice things, uh, nice treatments and remedies and things that we could use for sickle cell. For the male, the life expectancy right now today is 42 years old. For the female, a little bit higher. 
48 years old. We all know just in general that men, especially black men, die sooner than women, right? We, we often say that the man dies and the woman is left as the widow. We even say, especially in the African-American culture, we're not sure why black men pay into social security because they'd be dead by the time they get to spend it, okay? So just a little side note because the death rate is just ridiculous, okay? Now, we have all of this done. We've done our little grid here. I want you to know how important it is to think of sickle cell if you work in prenatal care or in the outpatient setting. I used to have this thing called preconception visits. Not everybody does it. In fact, very few do, but that's stupid. But I, of course, would offer this to my patients, um, my couples, if you will. They did not have insurance coverage for it because insurance is stupid and it doesn't cover it. But I would do a preconception counseling and I would charge $25 in which I would talk to couples who are planning their baby like they should so that the baby has the best bang for the buck. And I would talk to them at this preconception counseling. And if they were of African-American, Latino, Caribbean, or African descent, I would suggest to them that they have some of these genetic tests done, specifically sickle cell trait, because, you know, not everybody's mama and daddy remembers whether or not they got that little note in the mail that said their baby was sickle cell trait or sickle cell disease. And so it's very imperative that we always are, are um, proactive and check blood tests, easy blood tests, preconception at the preconception counseling visit. Um, and so I would talk to these, this couple about the need for that before they get pregnant. If the mother and the father chooses and there's um, concern uh, in the family about not knowing before they got pregnant, but certainly both of these parents having the trait, we can even do a chorionic villi sampling or an amniocentesis during the pregnancy. I don't see that done very often because this is not a deadly disorder and this child should, um, with lots of support, do well. So I don't really see that done, but you could do it and you did have to know that you could do it. And then of course, there's something you have to know a lot about and that is the neonatal metabolic screening panel. When a baby is born, there is a test that almost every state in the United States does. It is state-based, and it is a test for about 30 to 35 genetic and congenital disorders, sickle cell being one of them, cystic fibrosis being another, Tay-Sachs is another. There's lots of different PKU, um, all of that, cystic fibrosis, all of that is in this test. And the baby, there's one thing that you do have to know about this metabolic screening panel for this baby, and that is that the baby must have consumed protein for at least 24 to 48 hours before we can do the test, or it doesn't have much accuracy. And it's a PKU, uh, we used to call it the PKU test, and we stick the baby's heel to get enough blood to run these 35 tests. So 99.99.99% .99 of the time, if you were born in America, you got this done for the last 30 years or more, I would say the last 50 years. And your mother or father would get a notice in the mail two weeks later that, your, that their child had one of these conditions or that their child didn't have anything. Okay, so that's important to know. When it comes to diagnosing instead of just screening, because remember what screening means. Screening means that no matter which one of these tests we do, you always have to follow it up with the diagnostic test. So if we look at the diagnostic test, the gold standard is the hemoglobin electrophoresis. And for screening, a lot of times the dithionite um, test is done because it's cheap and it's fast. And the only thing is, if this is positive, if Dithionite test is positive, you still need a hemoglobin electrophoresis because this is a screening that's cheap and you know real fast, six minutes, I think. Okay, so just so you know, sometimes people call it a sickle deck screen. I mean, it just depends. The bottom line is there's plenty of testing and that there's so much testing in all um, parts of the life cycle 
that it should not be a surprise for anybody to be sickle cell positive and, and usually they know it when they're little, okay? In fact, if we look over here, we have had um, very important um, classes or lectures, I should say, based on what would happen with the first crisis ever, right? Because we know with this sickle cell, the patient's going to have their first crisis. So let's look at one more different lab, okay? This lab, if you remember, hemoglobin A, normal, hemoglobin S, sickle, hemoglobin AS, trait. This is hemoglobin F. In just normal people without sickle cell at all, we have about 90% hemoglobin A and maybe a couple percent of hemoglobin F. Hemoglobin F is fetal hemoglobin. God made no mistakes, so he made us perfect, right? So while we're inside of our moms, even if there's sickle cell disease in this baby when they're born, inside of mommy, it's perfect because that is when hemoglobin F is dominant. In other words, it's perfect. It's not sickle shape. It's not deformed. It's not sticky and fragile. It doesn't have a, um, a rapid death rate or any of that crap. So it's perfect because again, God made no mistakes. So this perfect fetal hemoglobin is in charge, large and in charge, I might say, uh, when the baby is born. So this fetal hemoglobin will live as long as regular hemoglobin off a red blood cell. And as you know, red blood cells live 120 days. So that means that this perfect fetal hemoglobin will live 120 days. So if you do the math, 120 days, 30, 60, 90, 120, oh, that's four months of age for the baby. So we rarely, if ever, see a crisis in a newborn because you have perfect fetal hemoglobin in charge for about four months. So when do we see that first crisis that may indeed be the first time this parent has ever even heard of sickle cell? Well, four to six months of age. Now, it's usually preceded by an upper respiratory infection that kids get or a fever of some sort, just from a virus. And this child presents in a very, very strange way. The patient, this child, this infant's hands and their feet will be super swollen, purpley, bluish, even red sometimes, hands and feet. It's called hand foot syndrome and it's often the very first crisis in a baby, this precious child will be inconsolable. There's nothing you can do to make them stop crying. And let me explain. Research has shown us that there are two conditions that are more painful than any other in medicine. One, you know it, is pancreatitis because the first nursing action is pain treatment in pain creatitis, right? So we call it pain creatitis because your first nursing action is treat the pain. Well, the other condition that is as painful as all get out and indeed the two most painful conditions on earth is sickle cell crisis. The sickle cell crisis hurts so bad, so incredibly, terribly bad there is no consoling this baby. And so sometimes, you know, this is a first time for the baby, depending on what's going on, what, where this child was born. Maybe they're visiting the United States. The parents may not have the benefit of the metabolic screening panel. And it may be your recognition as the nurse that really swollen hands and really swollen feet is sickle cell crisis, okay? All right, so lastly, for this introduction to sickle cell. I have a couple things to share with you. One is, what is this whole sickle business, okay? So I'm gonna do a demonstration and my girl's gonna follow and we're gonna show you just what normally happens in a typical 
red blood cell in the blood vessel type of patient like you and me. So I don't have sickle cell. This is what your body, if you don't have sickle cell, and my body are doing. This is my blood vessel, any given blood vessel in the body. Normally through this wonderful blood vessel of yours and mine, there's perfect hydration, which means there's nice um, fluid in the body, making sure that the blood flows through the blood vessel easily without problems. You're well hydrated. If I looked at the vessel, I could probably see the hydrated vessel in my, my skin. In fact, I want to show you this. I don't know if you can see it, but there is a blue vein here and it's it's easy to see. I didn't need a tourniquet. Um, if I were to drink a little bit more, it would probably get even bigger. So I don't know if you can see that, but can you see that? It's a little bit blue there. Uh, this one is not as blue, but you can look at my hand and see a bunch of blue vessels there. So that's all I'm saying. We're talking about this blood vessel. These are the red blood cells. You know they're shaped like a disc or a really good juicy donut, like Krispy Kreme down the street. I'm sorry, I get lost, stay with me. These donut shaped red blood cells flow through the red blood, I mean the blood vessel with no drama because of the well hydrated stat status of this patient. Now I want you to peep what I'm gonna do because my job is to make sure I teach you more than just some damn red blood cells. What is the, and watch my, questions because when I ask a question it means it's probably on the test. What is the most abundant intracellular electrolyte in every cell? Intracellular. I hope you got it. Potassium. So we're going to put a K in every one of these red blood cells. K, K, K. All right. What is the most abundant extracellular electrolyte, meaning outside the cell, but still in the vessel? I don't know if you're over there playing games or if you're actually figuring this shit out, but here we go. Sodium. So I teach you more than just a freaking blood vessel or a red blood cell. I want you to know your shit. What substance is intravascular, extracellular, made by the liver to help keep water in the blood vessel and provide an environment of protein? Albumin. Notice I made it yellow because when you give albumin, it's like a cloudy, yellowish, creamy kind of kind of color, yellowish, you know, at the uh, hospital. Albumin is put there by the liver and it is protein. You knew that. So in a normal blood vessel, we got potassium in our red blood cells and every other cell in the body. We got sodium, extracellular, intravascular floating with the water because sodium and water were married. Yeah, not like an American marriage. No divorce here. Where sodium goes, water follows, okay? So salt and water are married. Potassium's inside the blood cell. The albumin is inside the blood vessel to keep the fluid in the blood vessel. You good. That's you and me. However, let's look at this blood vessel because we got a problem, y'all. Mm -hmm. It's a problem, Houston. The problem is at least 40%, 50%, 80%, 90%, depending on what's going on, of the cells in this patient are sickled. Oh, yeah. Now, sickled cells are shaped like a sickle, which you used to use to cut in farming right cut the hay cut the the crops whatever um and i know your little ass ain't out there farming so you're probably like well what you sick of me man yeah 
Well, sickle means like a C shape, okay? But the bottom line with these sickle cells is that they have a sharp edge. And that sharp edge can get sticky and it makes this cell stick into the blood vessel. Let's just give you one of those right now. Let's say it's this one right here. So it got stuck in the vessel wall. It sticks together if a couple of things happen. But the bottom line is, instead of all perfectly round cells that flow through the blood vessel with no drama, we've got some sickled cells, a high percentage of sickled cells. Now what triggers Again, know the language for NCLEX. What triggers the human body to sickle? This bad boy right here. Times of hypoxia triggers sickling. All that means is if there is something in the body, if there's some situation with this patient in which they have a higher need for oxygen, or they already clearly present with less oxygen, they're going to have a sickling crisis. Their bone marrow is going to put out more blood, blood cells, more red blood cells to try to compensate for this anemia that the, the um, body is experiencing. And that's gonna make it worse because you have the hypoxia, less oxygen, the red or the bone marrow tries to compensate, put out more red blood cells because red blood cells have oxygen and that's a way to treat the hypoxia. Instead of these wonderful juicy red blood cells with oxygen being ready to help this patient with this hypoxia, a certain percentage because of a genetic disorder are sickled. Now you've got these sickled cells and if you look at sickled cells, they are fragile, they don't live long, they're sticky, they're, um, they clump together, they disrupt the vessel wall, they do all this crap, and they just don't live as long. Because here's the deal, y'all. Regular red blood cell hemoglobin is gonna live 120 days. We said that before with the fetal hemoglobin issue. We said that's about four months. But sickle cells only live max 20 days. So they're dying, and they're useless. And so because they're dying, you basically have a patient with anemia all the time. And then the, the bone marrow is trying to put this extra blood cells out to address the hypoxia. And some of those are sickled. And so we're just having a hot mess. Now, you might see this select all. This is the last thing I'm trying to get across to you. You might see this select all somewhere. I'm just saying. Other triggers include dehydration. What do I mean? Well, look at this blood vessel. You already know where I'm going. Remember I kept saying it was well hydrated? If I take the water out, these sickled cells are gonna stick even more. They're not gonna flow through at all. They're gonna get stuck. Where do they get stuck? Around joints, 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 and that's where the pain is. Infection and fever are both examples of when you need more oxygen and your basic metabolic rate goes up requiring more oxygen, again, hypoxia. So infection or fever. Extreme temperatures, really hot weather, really cold weather, or worse, somebody being clueless and taking an eight-year-old little girl recently and giving her ice packs for her sickle cell crisis because she had a fever of 104.9. So they gave her ice packs and they gave her a cold shower. Basically could kill somebody doing that. Extreme temps, cold or hot, hot weather. Really cold weather, really hot weather. Remember what cold weather does. It vasoconstricts. What does hot weather do? Well, it does vasodilate, but what else does it do? It dehydrates you as well as it makes you need more oxygen and typically you're breathing faster to get it. High altitudes. I have a 33 year old, she's older now, but I have a 33 year old student who's from the Caribbean 
she didn't get her first crisis, nor did she even know she had sickle cell until she got on a plane, flew her two kids to Disney World. This is my student, came in here and testified to this just earlier this year. She got on the airplane, decided she's gonna take them babies to Disney World. Uh, she went through my class, I think for LPN, came back for RN. She got on that damn plane and had a sickle cell crisis. First time ever. It's crazy. It's crazy, okay? So high altitudes, why is your behind got sickle cell and you decide to mountain climb in Colorado? We're going to pray for you and your sickle cell, okay? Exertion, ah, let me go there with you. Back in the day with the draft, they took our beautiful men and they threw them over there in Vietnam. And so everybody who got 18 years old had to sign up for the draft. And because it was wartime, your ass went straight to the military if they pulled your number. A significant number of military bases are in extremely hot environments. Everybody in my family has served. My brother went to Fort Seal. My baby, uh, my little cousin went to Fort Benning. Fort Seal's in Oklahoma. Fort Benning is in Georgia. My dad went to the Air Force. Everybody goes somewhere hot as hell, hot as fire, to go train in boot camp to get ready for this military. Well, what was happening? People were dropping dead right at the dang on boot camp while they was out there throwing down a uh, hundred push-ups. Why? Because a significant number of those men were sickle cell diseased patients. So if you have sickle cell disease, because of all that little experience we went through back in the day, you can't go in the military, okay? So you don't belong in the military with no sickle cell disease. How about trauma or surgery? I had a student come in here. She got called out right away. She had just been in my class just a few, maybe an hour, not even, maybe less. And she came in this class and she had this worried look on her face, told me that her 14 year old was waiting on the bus to go to junior high school fell, fell on the ice. She gets to the hospital. The baby is in, in uh, has hurt her knee and that child died less than 24 hours later. Her child, her 14 year old precious baby. Okay, so trauma, surgery, why? Because what happens when you do surgery? We lose blood. What is blood? Hemoglobin, oxygen, gone. Now you're hypoxic, now you're triggering a crisis. So not only trauma, surgery can trigger a crisis, so can anesthesia. Why? Because any anesthetic agent I give you will suppress your respiratory effort, creating a hypoxic situation. Pregnancy, oh, don't let me go there. Pregnancy is a time of blood clots anyway. And so not only pregnancy can trigger a crisis, but how about this? I had somebody in my class, I was teaching my babies about sickle cell. And she must have mentioned to the table that she was sitting at that she was on birth control pills because I said during the time I was teaching, your little ass can't be taking no estrogen if you have sickle cell. So she's talking to the students around the table and they all whispering, talking about, and I ain't even really half paying attention. Said they was getting louder. Looked like they was gonna punch her in her face. No, I'm just kidding. But looked like they was gonna have a fit over there if she didn't tell me, you better tell Doc, you better let Dr. Shelly, you better tell Shelly, you, I just, this is what I heard in the class. Like they was just going crazy. I said, what is y'all doing? Shit. Now, you're, you're acting crazy. What are you doing? You're loud, you're crazy. Miss Shelly, she gotta tell you something. Okay, like they had confession and shit. I, she stole your man, something crazy, you know. What did she got to tell me, baby? Show her. You show her what you got. They told her, show her what you got. She opened her purse and showed me her birth control. I said, okay, and? She said, well, they getting all hysterical, Miss Shelly, because I got sickle cell disease, and they said I got no business. I ain't got no business with no estrogen. And I said, well, that's for damn sure. Who gave you that? On the break, call that doctor. Fire them after you get through talking to them about a brand new prescription and fire them because they ought to know better than to give your ass an estrogen containing birth control. She should have had progesterone only. Now that was for free. You can pay me at the copay after class. Okay, now I hope you stand with me. Are you staying with me? Because you look like you sleep. Stay your ass with me. Now, alcohol is smoking. Now I already told you what smoking does. Every cigarette causes vasoconstriction for a whole hour. And it's 20 cigarettes in a pack. 
your ass smoking a cigarette and you got sickle cell? Shit, you don't like your life? What is the problem? You signed your will already, I hope, because you're on a quick path to death. Alcohol, same shit, different day. Acidosis, whole nother story. Venus stasis, you know what that is. Now listen, I'm gonna look at my board first. Let me see what I did. Don't, 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 don't. Okay, so if you get a case study and sister girl is visiting her family from the Bahamas and she has had um, joint pain and she thinks she has a fever and maybe caught something in the food that she was eating and she's doubled over, not having any fun whatsoever. Uh, and then she explains that her mother told her that she has sickle cell, but she didn't never really have any kind of episodes of a crisis. You are still trying to make sure you recognize what? Cues. What is her ethnicity? Why did the NCLEX put that in the question? What were her triggers? What's happening here with regards to her history? Okay. I hope you're with your girl now because we took care of the recognize and analyze. We got signs and symptoms though. So we're almost done, but I gave you a good start. I gave you the triggers. I gave you the demographics, history, baby, all that good stuff. Now, listen, I got to go now, child, and I'll be back now with part one. This was just an intro. The next one is part one. Then it's two, three, whatever, whatever, whatever. Deuces.